We're going to be dealing with a subject that is really going to take us two weeks to get through. Uh, it's a subject that really, I don't know, I don't think I've ever taught on godly discipline before. Um, maybe you've never heard a sermon on godly discipline before. There's just too much here to take in one week, and so it's going to take us a couple weeks. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to begin to define discipline and what that looks like, what the purpose of godly discipline in his life. We're going to begin to define what it even looks like as far as application, like what things in your life might be God disciplining you. And then we're going to define that. Next week, we're going to start applying that a little bit more and, and look at four different ways that God uses discipline for our benefit. So we're kind of headed in that direction. I just wanted to give you an idea. Um, but really, we have a lot of instruction to kind of take in this morning, but really a lot of encouragement too, as always. And so we're going to be reading verses 4 through 11 here in a moment. But as you think about discipline, what, what words might come to mind? What, what kind of, what conjures up in your mind when you think about that word? How about this, chastisement? Yeah, correction. Yeah, so, so when you think of these things, think of these things, is that a pleasant, does it, is that a pleasant sounding thing to you? Think of chastisement. I'm going to give you a definition of chastisement in a moment. It actually literally means to severely punish. How many of you have a positive connotation with those things? Now, you don't have to answer out loud. I just want to ask you, I want you to begin to think about that. Now, there's no question that we live in a broken world, right? I mean, so broken that as surely as the sun rises and the sun sets, we can expect pain and suffering. How many of you have realized that? You've figured that out in life, that it's, there's no skirting around pain. There's no skirting around suffering and tragedy. But I've noticed something through my years in church and years growing up with many people. I think we get confused when these inevitable sufferings come to us in our lives. Think about it. Deaths, accidents, diseases, perhaps. Relationship struggles, marriage struggles, persecution, pain, suffering in any way you can think of. We get confused when those things happen. And a lot of times we ask the question, why? Why? Sometimes I'll even hear somebody brave enough to ask the question, is God punishing me? Interesting question to ask this morning. We're going to begin to define what that looks like, what godly discipline actually looks like. But I think some people have this idea, actually I know, especially growing up in that charismatic movement, the charismatic church with, their, with so many false ideas and false understandings of faith, but they have this idea that being a Christian should somehow insulate you from troubles and pains. That if we just have enough faith, right, we can, we can get out of these circumstances. We might, we might even be able to prevent some of these circumstances in our lives. But what we need to do right up front is to be reminded of something very important. God never tells us that by following Jesus, we will be removed from pain and suffering and sorrow. Actually, he tells us the exact opposite. Have you ever considered that by following Christ, you actually open yourself up to more trouble? than just the normal, regular man or woman walking through this world by their own terms? More. We're actually told that. Not only do we face the same struggles and brokenness and pain by living in a broken world that everyone else does, but we have persecution for our faith heaped on top of that. We will not be insulated from calamity as Christians. We won't be. And so if that's ever been kind of part of your thinking, we need to set that aside right now. And we're going to start to biblically define what the Christian life looks like, what Christian discipline is, and what it's for. Now, what are we supposed to do with this reality that we can't get out of pain and suffering? It's just going to happen. It's going to come. That's, that's, that's a good step. It's a lot more than we can do than just that, though. And we'll look into it. Really what we need to do this morning is we need to understand pain and suffering from God's perspective. Because really at the end of the day, that's all that matters for us as Christians. What is God using it for? What is God using it for? 
Now, from our perspective, suffering a lot of times just looks like pain, doesn't it? It just looks like pain. And we don't like it and we hate it. But listen, from God's perspective, that suffering is discipline. Discipline. Now, with that in mind, let's look at Hebrews 12, 4 through 11. It says this, You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten my exhortation, which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges. Ooh, what a word. He scourges every son whom he receives. For it is for, or it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom this father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we, have, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we much, not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Now, of course, there's a lot there. Probably maybe some questions bouncing around in your head, and that's good. Before we go too far, let's begin to bring some definitions to what we're dealing with here. Now, the English dictionary describes or defines discipline as this. It's the practice of training people to obey rules or codes of behavior using punishment to correct disobedience. Okay? Now, some of, your, uh, some of your translations might use the word chastise here. Let's look at the English definition of chastising. It's this, to rebuke or reprimand severely. Now, the Greek word that is used here in these verses is actually a super broad term. There's variations of the word that's used throughout our reading in Hebrews 12, 4 through 11. And it's a broad term that doesn't just mean what we think of only when we think of discipline or chastising. It includes it. It includes it definitely. But it is not so narrow in its focus. And, and I'm, not, uh, I'm not faulting the English translators for, uh, for this word. I think dis discipline is probably the better word. But we just don't have a word, one word, that does this word in the Greek justice. It means chastisement. It does. It means punishment. It means discipline, but actually it has far more to do with training as a general principle. Training. Not just training through discipline, but training through all the ways that we train. All the ways that you would normally train a child. So more than anything today, like I said, we need to understand the Lord's perspective because that's what matters as we look at, as we look at this section. Now I want to give you the actual Greek definition here. And it includes all of these things, okay? So chastise or discipline in your translation. This is the Greek definition. The whole training and education of children. The whole, all of it. Which relates to the cultivation of mind, morals, and employs for its purpose, now, commands and admonitions, right? It's instruction and admonitions or rebukes. Reproof and punishment. It includes all these things. It also includes the training and care of the body, cultivates the soul, especially by correcting mistakes and curbing passions. Now that gives you a little bit better understanding, doesn't it? A little bit fuller picture of what we're dealing with here. Kind of what I want to get us to understand this morning is when we read this word discipline in the scriptures here, we ought to be thinking training. Training. God trains those whom he loves. But he does it using any tactic available to him as a parent would train their child. Training includes many things in order to accomplish its purpose, especially when we think of children. I can think of that in my own, own house. This is an easy analogy here, an easy correlation. I use a combination of tactics with my wife in order to train our children. Sometimes it's positive input. Other times it's living by example and showing them other times, it's giving our children enough pain to correct their foolishness. 
to correct their behavior away from things that are wicked, evil, and will eventually lead to their destruction. But we use a lot of different th uh, tactics, so to speak, to train. And so discipline or training is used to cultivate the heart, the mind, the soul of our children toward what? Toward integrity and towards righteousness, ultimately. That's the goal. I'm not training my child to be wicked. I'm training him to not be so wicked. So godly discipline is not only about punishment. We must understand this. However, and this is the point that seems to be kind of like a harsh, like a scrubby to our arm. It does include punishment. Sometimes severe, severe punishment. Like I said, this is where we sometimes bristle at the thought that God would not only allow, and this is really, really important, the scriptures is not teaching that God allows things to happen. The scriptures are teaching that God literally decrees them to happen for our benefit. A lot of times we, we, we bristle at the thought that God would literally bring severe punishment to our lives, that he would actually be the instigator of it in certain scenarios. And so we often want to deny this clear biblical teaching of godly discipline. We want to deny it wholesale, right off, right off the bat. Right off the bat. And I think maybe the misunderstanding comes down to the purpose of divine punishment in our lives. You see, when God punishes us for our disobedience, it's not to make us pay for our sin. He's not just trying to make us miserable, okay? Jesus already paid for our sin. It has nothing to do with God making you a little more miserable so that you can kind of feel miserable for the sake of feeling miserable and maybe pay a little bit for your sins. Jesus already paid our fine. It's paid in full. We could never pay a little more for our sins. Suffering in this life has nothing to do with salvation, nothing. Completely disconnected from it. It is for something, however, that is very, very specific in your life as a Christian, and it's this, sanctification. It's not salvation. It's not for salvation. It's for sanctification. God never brings discipline, like I said, just because he wants you to feel miserable or he wants to kind of throw a little jab in there, mess with you a little bit because you're just such a terrible guy and you sinned one too many times. But you know what? People think that way. People think that way. When things don't go the way they want, or when suffering and pain comes. Jesus is not throwing you a jab. He's not sucker punching you. Now, if you think of, puni if you think of punishment or discipline or suffering in that way, then you're going to miss everything God is trying to do in your life. Everything. You'll miss it all. And I'll explain what that looks like as we continue. He's trying to sanctify your heart and mind. He's trying to train you in righteousness, not make you miserable. He's trying to get your attention, though. He wants to get your attention because he wants to change the condition of where our heart is, where our mind is, where the direction in our life is going. Remember, God never punishes to hurt us. He punishes us because he loves us. He punishes us to help us to help. And before we break this discipline down any further, there's an important, an important point we need to start with. Whether there is pain in our lives in any way, it could be big or small. Think about all the ways, debilitating diseases, right? An illness, a death, a broken marriage, financial woes. Whatever it may be, the first question we need to start with is we need to look at our own lives and at our own hearts. Anytime you face any pain, any suffering, anything out of the blue that you just can't understand, the first thing we ought to do is begin to examine ourselves. Is there sin there? Is there disobedience? Is God trying to get my attention in some way? Sometimes it's hidden sin. Many times the sins that are the hardest to break free from are the sins of our motives. Those hidden things that people can't see on the surface that you've kind of crammed down so deep that you even forget that you're living in that way sometimes. And this is hard to do, especially in the moment, church. But every time that suffering comes, every time that chastisement comes, every time that pain comes, we ought to ask ourselves, is God bringing correction? Is God bringing correction? 
Now, these two concepts of discipline and chastisement are greatly resisted in our culture today, greatly. Actually, we don't like those words just in general, probably even to some degree here this morning. Using punishment, mild or severe, as a corrective tool is considered cruel and unusual in this society. Our culture discourages discipline of our children, both in the home and school. Our culture discourages discipline in the workplace. Our culture discourages discipline in punishment, even for criminals. We lack a system of justice, literally completely, in this culture. And of course, the results of this have been catastrophic, right? Our nation's children are, by and large, entitled, sniveling, disrespectful, whining brats. Amen. Our workplaces are places of dysfunction and, listen, mediocrity. And our criminals are emboldened and even encouraged to commit more crime. Why? A lack of discipline. A lack of chastisement. And, of course, our culture is out of control. But it's not only the secular areas in life that have kind of given up on discipline. Within the church, discipline is almost discounted wholesale. Discipline, church discipline, God-honoring church discipline, and the way it's laid out in the scripture, is literally non-existent in the vast majority of churches. Non-existent. People living in open sin with no consequence, no recourse, no repercussion. And what has the church done to replace godly discipline? You know what they've done? They've replaced it with good-sounding things like love and grace and patience, right? Those sound good. Because in the human mind, discipline and chastisement are completely incompatible with love and grace and patience. But actually, love and grace without the care of discipline is actually hatred. It's hatred. And it's severely damaging to your faith and to church life in general. Love without discipline is hatred. You see, our culturally, culture has certainly changed, church. There's no question. It's changed in recent years. However, it's important to realize and remember, God doesn't change with culture, amen? Actually, we're going to get to it in the next chapter, Hebrews 13. God is the same t yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He doesn't change. Just because your thoughts on discipline have changed, that doesn't change anything about the truth concerning it. Listen, and when it comes to God's children, those who are in Christ, because that's who this is written to, it's not written to people who are outside of Christ. When it comes to God's children, he is concerned primarily with one thing. It's your holiness. It's your sanctification. God places your eternal soul, your eternal spirit, far above the physical aspect of your life. It's far more important to him. Far more. And God will always care deeply about the character and the spiritual development of his children. Always. Because ultimately, his desire is for us to become more and more like him. For us to become holy as he is holy. Now, let's consider the desire for the conduct of those that represent God as his children. God has a code of conduct, we'll call it, for us as Christians. It's all throughout the scriptures. Therefore, live worthy of the calling in which you have been called. That's a code of conduct. But we have another one here from 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. There's a code of conduct in your life as a, as a Christian. It's right there. Be holy even as God is holy holy. Church, have you ever considered that to be holy as God is holy is not a suggestion? It's actually a command. It's a command, it's a command from God. You are to be holy even as I am holy. God's not suggesting that if we get around to it, we ought to be working on it. 
It's the way, it's the endeavor, it's the striving of the true child of God to be holy as he is holy. And the reason is, is because holiness is the way of the Father, it's the way of the Son, and it's the way of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Now the question becomes, how do we become more holy? How do we become more holy? How do we become sanctified? It's a question I think a lot of people ask. How do we become true disciples following after Christ? Well, the answer is actually very simple. We just don't like the answer probably. It's through discipline. That's how God does it. That's his way. That's his course. Now, we have a lot to look at here, and like I said, it'll be taking us a couple weeks to unpack it all. Today, we're going to define discipline. We're going to look at the, the, the call of discipline. We're going to be looking at three things in particular. Next week, we're going to be looking at the four ways in God which God uses discipline in our life. But before we get too far, I want to make a very important point. We've got to have kind of a, like a foundation to move forward from. It's vital that we begin to change our minds about discipline right now, about chastisement, and about its role in our lives, and how God uses it, actually quite often, far more than we ever realize, and he uses it for our good. Chastisement and good. I want you to put those two words together right now. Maybe you've never done that before. Discipline and good, I want you to attach those things. Discipline and love, I want you to attach those things together. And brothers and sisters, we know that we are loved by God according to the scriptures when he disciplines us and chastises us. It's how we know we belong to him. It's how we know that he owns us as his children. Discipline, even very severe discipline, is a vivid and important expression of God's love for you in this life. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you accept that? And so I want to ask you this question. Are you grateful for God's discipline? That's, that's one question. You don't have to answer. Just, are you grateful for it? How about this? Do you even recognize it? Do you even recognize it as such? And the third question I want to ask is, do you see his love in your discipline? Or, when life begins to get difficult, when our marriages struggle, when our finances collapse, when we struggle with depression, when we're injured, when we get sick, do you chalk it up kind of as happenstance and just shrug it off as, well, bad things just happen? I bet you most of the time we do that. Yeah, we live in a broken world. Bad things just happen. Or do you consider that maybe God is trying to get your attention? Maybe he's trying to get your attention. Actually, I would say this. Most of the time, he is trying to get your attention. And there's a warning right from our text that proves that most of the time we think it's just happenstance. Most of the time, we miss it, church. We miss when God is trying to get our attention completely. We don't even consider it. We don't even consider it. Maybe God is bringing you mild or even se severe chastisement right now, this morning, because he loves you. He wants to awaken you, and he wants you to get your life in order around him. He wants you to be a true disciple. He wants to train you in holiness. Now, to some of you, perhaps, I hope not, but the fact that God would punish you severely, that sounds like blasphemy. <laughs> no way, right? My God would never, ever. He only loves me. Maybe the God you've been told about or want to believe in would never rebuke you harshly. Maybe he would never bring bitter circumstances to your life pain, maybe he would never punish you severely. Now I'll say this, if that's the God that you have believed in, and what I want you to do before we get too far is put that idol that you serve away, because that's not the God of the Bible. Put that idol away, this false God that you've served, and let's begin to look at who God really is, the purpose of discipline in your life. Let's begin to recognize it, let's begin to accept it, and more than that, let's begin to be changed by it for the sake of holiness. Holiness. 
That's what we have to do. That's where we're going. Now, the writer of Hebrews understood the important role of God's discipline in the life of the believer. And he encourages us in three specific things that we're going to look at this morning before we look at the next stuff next week. First, it's this, that we must not make light of God's discipline. I'll tell you what that means in the Greek in a minute because I think it's interesting. Second, that we must not lose heart or fall into despair when God is disciplining us. And thirdly, we must understand the explanation of why he's doing it. Three very, very important things. First, let's consider the importance of taking God's discipline seriously. Hebrews 12, 4 through 5 speaks to this. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. There's the first warning. Now, part of the problem with Christians, especially in this culture, is that we're so offended when we are presented with the idea that our suffering, suffering could be a direct discipline from the Lord. What do we want to do? What, how do we want to feel when we're suffering? We want to feel like the victim. We want to feel like, oh, woe is me. Let me eat some worms. The world's collapsing around me, and we want to be the victim. We get offended that it's God bringing discipline because we are living in disobedience to him. That there are consequences to those disobediences that we have brought upon ourselves. Boy, that takes the victim right out of it, doesn't it? You can't play the victim when you understand what God is actually doing through discipline. And so we reject suffering as discipline because of our sin because it doesn't play into our victim mentality. It doesn't allow us to have self-pity. It doesn't allow us to do that. So we take our sufferings lightly. We look at our sufferings and we make excuses as to why we could be experiencing these things. But we often fail to make the connection that it's God throwing up stop signs, warning signs in our own lives. Now, I'm just going to ask some questions this morning. Are you struggling in your marriage? Are you struggling with your finances? How about your relationships? In a general term. Health? Are your children rebellious? Does your life seem like one disappointment after another? Have you ever considered that it's God bringing chastisement for your disobedience? Have you ever considered that? Or are you busy playing the victim? Are you busy making excuses, blaming other people, blaming other circumstances instead of looking at yourself? God brings retribution, and yes, I use that word specifically, to awaken his children. He brings retribution. Severe repayment for our continued life of sin against him. And if you don't believe me, we're going to be looking at several stories in a moment that will show you just how biblical of an idea that is. Have you considered that nothing in your life as a Christian happens randomly and without a purpose? Don't chalk anything up ever to, well, I guess it's just life in the world. God has a plan for it. He's purposed it. And sometimes, and I'm not saying every time, we're going to look at the four different reasons these things happen next week, but sometimes, and I would even probably venture to say most of the time, there are consequences to our own sin. Consequences to our own sin. God didn't make your marriage fall apart, but because of your sinful living within your marriage, that is a consequence, and the discipline that came was a broken marriage. God didn't make your finances fall apart. You disobeyed by not giving him, giving to him what is due him. And so what did he do? He frustrated your finances. When we live in sin, undeterred, the outcome is severe pain, severe suffering, severe discipline, opportunity, really, for the Lord to train you. God has an appointed purpose in everything, even what you're facing right now, no matter how severe, no matter how difficult, no matter how hard it is. There's a purpose for it. But too often when life's trials come, we are frustrated. We become unhappy. 
We struggle along, and then what happens? We act insensibly, completely insensibly. We fail to make the connection that God is trying to get our attention, and we just blame everyone else. We have pity parties. We want to be the victim because it feels good to our flesh to not take responsibility is what it does. It feels really good. Really, really good. And all the while, God's throwing up warning signs in the form of discipline. And, 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 and what he's saying is, hey, stop going this way. Stop it. Turn around. Turn around. Now, I'm just going to say this very bluntly, right, right up front, very broadly. I'll define it more next week. But it's this. Our struggles and afflictions are the hand of God, the rod of God in our lives. That's what our struggles and afflictions are. I know I said that very broadly. I'll define it in, 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 in more specific terms next week, but let's just count it as that. That's what it is. All of it. In some way, it is the hand and the rod of God in training, in discipline. In some way. I don't know how many, totally how many ways yet, but I've identified and outlined at least three, maybe four for next week. There might be more as I actually get into it. And yet, what do we do? What do we do when suffering comes, when pain comes, when calamity comes? We take it lightly. The Greek literally means to literally not even look at it. To look past it. To completely just look past it. Ignore it. Not ignore the suffering, ignore the source of it. Ignore the reason for it. Not try to get to the source of why it is. Like I said, the Greek means we give it no thought. We take it lightly. Could this be a discipline from the Lord? <laughs> no, give me a break. No, I'm not even going to give that a thought. Ludicrous. And what then is the outcome when we give the discipline of God in our lives no thought? What's the outcome? Inevitably, it's failure. Inevitably. God's trying to get our attention to direct our course we don't give it attention. We continue on the same course. And it's actually a lot of times what I see happening, and, and, I, and, I, and I talk about this in counseling, and maybe I've said this to you before in counseling. You're driving towards the cliff right now. God has thrown up a thousand do not enter stop signs. And if you keep going, you're just going to fly off that cliff. The things in your life sometimes, many times, is God lovingly trying to warn you before you crash and burn. Before. And so what happens when we fail the test, when we don't even give it a thought that possibly it's the Lord bringing discipline into our life? Well, we learn nothing. We stagnate in our faith. We go back to the same foolish behavior over and over again, and we open ourselves up to the Lord, bringing that discipline again and again and again and again and again until we finally open our eyes and see it. He loves you enough to do that, right? Right? He's not going to just stop because you're not seeing it. He's going to bring it more severe and more severe and more severe and more severe until you finally open your eyes. Throughout my life as a Christian, I have known far too many Christians that always seem to be struggling and failing and flailing in their faith. They're not really growing. And yet all the time, I notice they're grumbling, complaining, and always blaming people for their situations for their failures. They're looking right past God's attempt. They're paying them no mind. And then what happens? They don't mature in their faith. And it's easy to understand. It's easy to see. A child that doesn't receive discipline, and we're going to get to this in a moment, can never be trained. They're obstinate. They're foolhardy. They're hard-headed. Or, as the Old Testament says, they're stiff-necked. More than that, they're self-absorbed. They're self-centered. And they only want comfort from life in God. They only want comfort from their faith. And they want to reject everything else wholesale that doesn't serve their fleshly state. So I'm going to rewarn us, church. Don't fail in the discipline. Don't take it lightly. Don't pay it no mind. Secondly, and this will be very brief but important, we must not lose heart when God disciplines us. Now, what does this tell us about discipline, church? If God's telling us right now, don't lose heart, listen, I'm going I'm I'm to bring discipline because I love you, but don't lose heart. Why does he say that? Because it's painful. Church, it's painful. It's painful, that's why. God knows that. 
He's not callous to the fact that it's painful. He knows that. It's supposed to hurt, church. Discipline is supposed to. It is supposed to be hard. It is supposed to be. It is supposed to be a shock to the system to wake up the senses, the spiritual senses. That's what it's supposed to be. That's what it's for. And so because our flesh is so weak and it's susceptible to pain and corruption, then God tells us, in the midst of all this talk about discipline and chastisement, I love God, how he does this. He encourages us. He literally encourages us, as he says right here. Nor faint when you are reproved by him. Don't take it lightly, but also don't faint. Don't lose heart when God is punishing you because he knows it hurts. He does. We're going to expand on this in a moment, but we must remember that discipline is grounded in God's fatherly care for us, church. That's what it stems from. The point is clear. We must not miss it. In the face of suffering and struggle, in the face of disappointments and persecution, God has not nor will not abandon you. That is not why you're suffering right now. To try to see if you can do it on your own. That's not why. He's right there with you. He just wants you to learn so that you will grow in your holiness and your sanctification, that you will be trained. God has not forgotten us in our suffering and our pain. He's not treating us as rejects or those who are unwanted. That's not what's going on. Church, on the contrary, he's treating us as sons and daughters with the deepest love a, a father can have for his children. We have to start making that connection. Brothers and sisters, when we face discipline, even severe, he's owning us as his. He's telling us, hey, because you're my son, because you're my daughter, I love you. And listen, I will walk through this with you to completion. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. He's telling us you're mine and because you are mine. I'm going to care for you in the way that a loving father cares for his children. That's what I'm going to do. And so we must not respond to discipline in the extreme of despondence, of despair, of depression, and of brokenness. We have to resist that. That's what the enemy wants, brothers and sisters. The enemy wants to use that discipline and he wants to turn it into something it's not. And he wants to get you to doubt God and he wants to get you to run away from God and he wants to get you to become depressed and despondent to the work of the Lord in your life. And there's a real danger in despising the discipline of the Lord, church, a real danger. If we grow faint and if we lose heart in the middle of our, dis our discipline, we will then harden our heart towards God. And instead of responding to God in love and, and, and striving and pressing forward in sanctification, what we'll do is we'll respond with anger, resentment, and impatience. You see, that is the work the enemy wants to do in you if you are facing struggles and consequences for sin in your life. It can be hard to remember, but it's vital to keep this thought, even in the midst of great discipline from the Lord. It's for our benefit. Always keep that in mind, church, always. It's one of the ways we will not grow faint. We will not lose heart. It's for our benefit, but also we know it's a promise from our Father who loves us in heaven that he'll sustain us through whatever discipline he has in store. Next week we might look at some, I, I've read several stories throughout my life of many missionaries and many men of the faith who have faced just discipline from the Lord you can't even fathom. And you, you would ask yourself, why would God do this and allow this and bring this to this man's life? And of course, near the end of the life, you see why and how and God, wh wh how, wh how God did it, why God did it. In the moment, if those men would have lost faith, it would have been a disaster. But they didn't, they pressed on. So those are the warnings, church, there's two of them. Don't take the Lord's discipline lightly and don't lose heart. But what's the most important issue of the day that I want to get to today? Well, it's the matter of the why, the why portion. Why does God bring discipline? Well, Hebrews 12, 6 through 11 addresses that. 
For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are in illegitimate children and not sons. There, furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of the spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as they as seem best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So he disciplines us because he loves us, church. It's very clear. It's right there in order that we may grow in our sanctification or holiness. It's a pretty simple reason of why. Why? Well, he loves you, and he wants you to grow in your faith. Pretty simple. He's not disciplining you for all the, the, the crazy, negative things that you can think of. He's not just jabbing you. He's not sucker punching you. He's not trying to take the wind out of your sails. He's actually doing the opposite of those things. Remember, brothers and sisters, and we're going to hit hammer this point in, in the moments to come. Discipline is training. Discipline is training. And in a sense, it's comparable to the discipline of your earthly parents. And in another sense, it's not even related. <laughs> I love how the scriptures do that. Hey, in one sense, it's kind of like that, but really, it's nothing like that. It's nothing like that. Now, let me explain. Loving parents discipline their children in order to correct them. That's what a loving parent will do. You want to see a parent who doesn't love their kid? You've seen them at the store, probably. Their children are running around like hurricanes, destroying everything, paying their parents no mind, doing whatever they want, and receiving no retribution, no punishment. Those are parents that hate their kids. Okay? Parents that love their children, discipline their children in order to correct sinful, prideful, disobedient attitudes. That's what a loving parent does. So in this way, there's a comparison in the discipline with God to the discipline of our own parents. But this is very key to understand. The Bible says that the earthly parents discipline us for a short time, not for our whole lives, but for a short time, and only in the ways that seem best to them in the moment. That's all an earthly parent can do. But it's saying is our parents often discipline us out of ignorance, without a way forward. Really, they did the best they could. That's what this is saying. Your earthly parents, well, they did the best they could. Hopefully. If you're lucky, your earthly parents did the best they could. Some of them do the worst they could. But if you're lucky, your earthly parents did the best they could. Sometimes they disciplined us in a way that just seemed right at the time. But maybe they took that discipline far too far, way too far. Maybe they didn't bring it far enough. Maybe they disciplined out of anger and then it wasn't for our benefit at that moment. But earthly parents do, loving ones anyway, raise their children the best they can. And for those of us who are raised by loving and yet fallible parents, what happens when we get older? Boy, we respect that. We respect that discipline. We get it. It makes sense. We know why they did it, even if we don't always know why when we're younger. My father, he's sitting over there, didn't always take the best approach to disciplining me. Sometimes it went a little over the top. But as I got older, I respected him because I knew he loved me. Whether he knew how to go forward in that moment or not, he did it because he did the best he could. And I honor him for that. I thank him for that. And under normal circumstances, under normal discipline circumstances, that's really the conclusion that all of us will come to as we grow older. You know, they, they, they did the best they could. My fallible parents did the best they could. You know what? I'm a fallible man. I'm doing the best that I know how. Is it always right? No, the Bible says that. Sometimes it just seems right to me at the time. And so we appreciate our parents' efforts in raising us. We respect our parents because they tried to, at least, develop our character. Honestly, I really pity those people who were never taught by their parents, never disciplined by their parents to guard their hearts, to resist their impulses, to resist their flesh, to bridle their tongue. As adults, they are nothing but toddlers in adult bodies. They don't know how to operate. 
Now that's what earthly parenting is for. But godly parenting doesn't discipline us in what seems best. Godly parenting, godly, godly discipline, disciplines us for our good. There's a purpose, and it's always good. God doesn't just kind of throw something at the wall and hope it sticks. Ah, I think this is best. No, he disciplines for our good. There is a specific purpose for it. He knows where it's going. He knows why he's doing it. He knows exactly how to do it. He knows exactly how much heat to put on, how much pressure to put on, what's going to be too much for us to bear at this moment in our life. But maybe if we continue, won't be too much down the road. He knows all of it. And he does it all for our good. That is a completely different way than our earthly parents do it. So like I said, there's some similarities, but in reality, it's nothing like. Because God does it all in perfection. Every discipline he's ever brought in your life and mine, it's perfect. It's good. That's what that word good means, by the way. Perfect. Every chastisement, no matter how severe, no matter how painful, it's for our good. It's not random. It's not spur of the moment. And it's never over the top. And I'll say this. It's never unfair. Ever. Ever. God's discipline is never unfair. And I hear that so often. It's not unfair. If it was unfair, God wouldn't do it. It's fair. And it's right. And here's the goal of discipline, church. It's in order that we may share in his holiness. What an awesome outcome. What an awesome thing. How in the world would God, and why in the world would God, should God ever allow me, a broken, sinful man, to share in his perfection, in his holiness, in his righteousness? Why? What an awesome reward, church. What an awesome reward. There's no question here as to whether God knows what he's doing. There's never anything uninformed about God's discipline and chastisement in your life. Like I said, he's never unfair. Now, here's the question. Do you believe that? Because that's the truth. But the question is this morning, do you believe that? Now, why am I stopping here to make such an important point on this, if you believe it or not? Because if you don't believe it, you will never respond to it. That's why. And if you don't respond to it, you will never be trained, ever. Do you believe that God disciplines you, even severely because he loves you? Do you believe that? Do you give God the same benefit of the doubt that perhaps you gave your earthly parents who disciplined you in the way they thought was best, although it was not good sometimes, but you give them the benefit of the doubt? Why don't we afford God that same benefit of the doubt? Why do so often when things go wrong, we raise our fists at God and say, how dare you? How unfair? Why? Right? We're not giving God, who's literally disciplining us out of perfection for our good. He's doing it right. And we don't give him the same benefit of the doubt that we give our fallible parents. Pretty odd, isn't it? Now listen, is punishment pleasant? No. But remember, it's not supposed to be. God's not punishing us because it's pleasant. It's not supposed to be. Our scripture even says that. Discipline, discipline never is ple pleasant. It's, it's, it's always sorrowful at the time. We don't like it. There's no getting around that. Discipline is distasteful. Suffering is not fun. Pain is hard to endure. Discipline is corrective, and what it does is it steers our flesh in the direction it doesn't want to go. That's why we need the discipline, because our flesh doesn't want to go there. So God has to get us out of those ruts of sinful living. And sometimes he's got to come like a wrecking ball and smash us out of those ruts. And I mean wrecking ball. And we're going to look at ways that God has been a wrecking ball in that way. Not a wrecking ball for destruction, a wrecking ball for good, but it had to force somebody severely out of the path they were going. Severely. We don't want to go in a direction that our flesh hates. We never do. That's why we need trained in holiness, so that at some point in our life, we want to <laughs> hunger and thirst and go after righteousness. We, we strive for it. And so God will do whatever it takes to force you out of your sinful ruts, your sin sinful ideals, your sinful mindset, your sif sinful direction, thoughts, your sinful words, everything. He wants to get you out of those ruts. 
And discipline makes us look at our habits and the things we're doing in, in life from a more biblical perspective. And he does it, God does that, through pain. Pain. And as a child that has dealt a painful blow on the bottom by their loving father, when he deals that blow to the child's bum with a little rod or some, a little spoon sometimes, what happens to the child? Well, they cry, don't they? It hurts. Of course they cry. It's not pleasant. And listen, so do we too at times when the Lord brings discipline. We cry. It hurts. We suffer. There are periods of pain, suffering, and struggle in the discipline that we do cry, that we do become unhappy even. There's a period of time in discipline, and especially severe discipline, when we're trying to come to terms with the consequences of our own sin. Hopefully that's what we're trying to do. And the implications of how this changes our lives. And I'll tell you right now, sometimes God's punishment changes the entire course of our earthly lives. But what's the purpose, church? It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That's what verse 11 tells us. It produces for those who have been, righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Now that is key. For those who have been trained. That's a qualifier. That's what that is. It's called a qualifier in the English language. God is disciplining you. It's going to do good things. But the qualifier is if you allow yourself to be trained. You don't just get them. It's not random. You don't just go to school, right? Let's say you went into a school this morning and you just sat there. But you didn't listen. You didn't take notes. You didn't study. Did you learn anything? No. Just going to school doesn't teach you, okay? Just going to the gym and watching people work out doesn't give you a six-pack, right? Or if you're Lego Batman, a nine-pack. My, my, I think Matthew talks about Lego Batman's nine-pack all the time. He didn't get that by sitting there. He got that by training. Training. The Hebrew Christians here in the book of Hebrews are being urged to be trained by their sufferings. Trained by them. In other words, if the discipline is to have its desired effect, they are not merely, and this is important, to endure what they are suffering. You're not called to just endure suffering. You and I are called to be trained by it. Big difference. It's not good enough to just suffer this kind of uh, begrudgingly attitude and hope it just gets over. That's not training. That's not training. That's despising it, actually. That's despising the discipline. Oh, I just can't wait till this gets over. I'm going to crawl in a hole for three years until this just goes away. It's not training. It's, it's not, that's not training. That's not the goal of godly discipline. You must be trained by the suffering. Trained. Training is hard, isn't it? Training is hard. Man, I don't want, if I had to, I hope I never have to run like a marathon or something. Like, I, I mean, I'm going to, I, I, I would, I, I, someone would have to force me like by, 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 by gunpoint or something. But I hope I never have to do that because I don't want to train for that. I don't want to train for that. It'd be horrible. I can't think of anything more boring in my life than running for no purpose. But if I was going to run a marathon and do it well, I would have to train for it. I have no choice. And sometimes our discipline, we have no choice in the matter. Actually, pretty much all the time. God's going to bring it. Are you going to be trained by it? And the truth is that there are many Christians, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, condemning anyone's faith this morning. You may truly be in Christ. But God has brought discipline after discipline after discipline after discipline in your life and you've learned nothing. You've learned very little. Why? Why? Because you haven't been trained. You haven't allowed the Lord to use that discipline to actually train you for your good so that you can be somewhere else 
five years from now that you're not today. That's what sanctification is. I mean, you should be able to look back at the last year, two years, three years, four years, five years of life, and you should see the change God has done in your life. You should see it. It should be palpable. It should be tangible. You should be able to define it. Actually, I do that sometimes as an exercise to people who are struggling in their faith. Hey, let's just get a piece of paper out right now. Think of who you were three years ago. Okay, write that down. Now think of what God has done, who you are today. Do you see a change? Now if not, there's a problem. But if there is, then praise God. You might not be as far along as you want to be, but none of us ever are. Now there are a lot of people who it takes very little discipline or chastisement and they learn a ton. They, they, they grow exponentially in their faith very quickly. I've seen that too. Just a little discipline. Just a little. I often wish it were enough just to read the word of God, right, and obey it automatically. Wouldn't that be so wonderful, church? Man, that would be great. What a cool thing that would be. It doesn't happen that way usually. We're, oh, foolish Galatians, right? Or oh, foolish Living Water Bible Church members. Oh, foolish. Why don't we just read it and obey it? Our flesh is strong, church. That's why it's really strong. And so God has to have more than just his word. And I thank him that he does have more than just his word. His word gives us the truth, right? It's like the song to our ears that, that enlightens us to the light and the truth of Christ. But it's the discipline that actually forces this into our heart. That actually takes that song, that beautiful song, and helps us to play it and live it. It's the discipline that does that. Amen. But he, because even though we know what he commands, we know what he expects, we don't always obey. And so what is God's recourse? What is his natural way of dealing with us? Discipline, church. It's it. Training. That's his natural way. It's supernatural. But what I mean by natural is it's just the way he, it's his go-to. He wants to get our attention. And listen, God can use all sorts of circumstances as attention getters. All sorts. And probably all of us this morning have experienced some of these intention getters. Lost employment. Out of control debt. Naughty kids and rebellious teens. Marriage struggles. An injury. A disease. A divorce. An accident. Even death. Just to name a few. Attention getters. The burdens can be large or small, but they're all aimed to get your attention and to get you out of those sinful ruts and patterns. That's God's desire because his desire is to sanctify you. Now, am I saying some of the most tragic circumstances of life are directed and can be directed by God as punishment in your life? Am I saying that? Yes. I am, but I'm not saying it. The Bible says it and the Bible teaches it. It's clear. It's all over. Yes. Scriptures are filled with stories of the Lord's discipline, large and small, sometimes subtle. Because sometimes the men of the faith and the women of the faith didn't really realize they were being sinful. They just made a decision without consulting the Lord first. So God brought subtle discipline. Sometimes God brought very harsh discipline. Now, I thought of Elisha this week. Do you remember when he ran away from Jezebel in fear after Jezebel put the, uh, the prophets to death? And what did, what did what Elijah do? Did he consult the Lord? No, he hightailed it out of town. He said, I'm getting out of here. I am going to preserve my life. And you know what the Lord did to, dis to, to, to discipline him? He let Elijah travel for 40 days and 40 nights in the wrong direction, only to when he got there, he said, okay, Elijah, no, go back. Ouch. That hurts. That's a long journey to get where you're going. And then God's saying, oh yeah, by the way, uh, uh, Elijah, you never asked if I wanted you to come here. I don't want you here, actually. I want you to go back. Oh, 40 more days. 40 more days back. Ouch. But what happened? God sustained him. If you remember that story, God fed him along the way. Sustained him. But it hurt. It was subtle punishment, but it hurt. 
Now we see gentle correction in Paul's life. Paul was a man prone to pride and arrogance. You can see it throughout his writings. He mentions it often, how prone he was to arrogance and pride. He was the Jew of Jews, man. He was the bees and knees, the cat's meow. He, and, and really, before he was in Christ, he really thought that. And I guarantee that persistent pride didn't just go away overnight in him. It took God literally hammering at that pride out of his life through severe sometimes, but also subtle sometimes, discipline. Now, God gave him some gentle discipline to keep his pride in check. And this was a preventative discipline. We're going to talk about that form of discipline next week. And this discipline that God brought him wasn't passing either. It stayed with him his whole life. What is it? Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. It says this, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. And I don't know why, maybe you have been taught that we don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. If you've ever been told, that is the most ridiculous thing in the whole entire world. We're told right here. <laughs> We're told in, this, in, this, uh, in this, uh, um, this narrative right here. I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you what this... What, it, what the thorn in his flesh was. There was a thorn, given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Listen, he's saying God sent me a messenger from Satan to torment me for my good. You know who else had a messenger from Satan to torment him for his good? It was Job. I mean, I have time to get into that this morning. Listen, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly. Wow. Wow, God got him out of a, a rut of pride pretty quick. He can say, most gladly, most gladly, he says. Most gladly. Therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with these thorns in my flesh. What are they? Insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That was a thorn in Paul's flesh. Everywhere he went, he was treated like garbage. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was thrown in prison. He was stoned. Everywhere he went. He knew when he went into a town, he knew God was going to keep his pride in check because he knew he was going to be under distresses. That was his thorn. God said, no, I'm not taking that from you, Paul. I'm not taking it from you. You're going to go to the town. You're going to preach the gospel. You're going to go in there knowing you're going to be insulted and hated and probably beaten, maybe thrown in prison. Hey, don't worry. My grace is sufficient for you. Go ahead and do it anyway. That was God's discipline for Paul, to be mocked and beaten and insulted. Now, what was Paul's outcome? What, 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 did, what conclusion did he come to? What conclusion did he come to? He recognized it was the gift from the God because he knew without that, he would get proud and arrogant for the work he was doing for Christ. Look at me. Hey, other disciples, how many people have you led to Christ this week? I led 3,000 yesterday. God said, no, that's not going to be you, Paul. And so you're going to get your, your butt kicked when you go into this town. You're going to get thrown in prison. Listen, but God doesn't only discipline gently. He also dis disciplines very severely. Very severely. Now, there's too many stories throughout the Bible to look, but, I, but let's just think of some easy, some low-hanging fruit, okay? Low-hanging fruit. David and Bathsheba. Now, we're not going to go through the whole story. You can read that later if you'd like to. He disciplined David and Bathsheba severely, severely. The child that was, that was conceived and born out of murder and fornication, what did God bring to that child? Death. Does that sound like your God to you? It is, if you claim to believe in the living God of the Bible. But I want you to understand, it wasn't just the death of that child that God brought as punishment. God told David, through the prophet Nathan, that the sword will never leave your house your entire life. Punishment. What happened? Well, David faced coups like crazy from every direction. Murder was in his home. The death of other children were in his home. Literally, that man lived through tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, attempt on his life, coup, you name it. God told him, because of your sin, the punishment is not only am I taking this child that was conceived in sin, but the sword will never leave your house. Ouch. Severe pain. God brought all that church. God did that. Chastised David and Bathsheba. Does that offend your human ideas of who you think God is? Of how seriously you think God takes sin in our life? 
Does it offend your ideas about him? Or does it awaken you to how seriously God takes sin in our life? Small and big. How about Ananias and Sapphira? If you want to say, well, that was Old Testament, Pastor John. It doesn't matter. God's the same yesterday, today, today, and forever. So let's look at the New Testament. You might not be familiar with the story of Ananias and Sapphira, but you're about ready to be reminded. Acts 5, 1 through 11. This is a New Testament church. But a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of your land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And a great fear came over all who heard it. The young men got up, Oh, I did, did I not go on? I'm sorry. Verse 6. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now, there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it you, that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And a great fear came over the whole church. And over the, those who heard all these things. Now, were these people unsaved, unbelievers? No, I believe they were saved people in the church. God brought swift, severe punishment for their sin. What was their sin? Well, they lied about the land. They told Peter and everyone, hey, we're going to sell our land. We're going to give the church all the money. And then they didn't. And they gave them what they felt like giving. They saved some back for themselves. Not only did they lie to God, but they withheld their giving from the Lord. They withheld it. And God struck them dead. That's severe punishment, isn't it? God did that. Does that offend you? I hope not. Now, maybe by comparison this morning, your punishment seems small to those very severe. Maybe not. Maybe you've had very similar. But that's not the point, church. The point in all this is do you recognize spiritual discipline? Next week, we're going to look at how we can more readily recognize it in, in, in the way God uses spiritual discipline. Do you recognize that often it's spiritual discipline that is the, very, is, the, is the source of struggle? It's the reason you're struggling right now is God is disciplining you because of some sinful pattern that you haven't recognized. You've been too foolish to see on your own and so God lovingly brings it to your attention. Wake up call. God always disciplines those whom he loves. Getting your attention with trials and with difficult circumstances. That's the way of God's fatherly discipline. We need to make that connection. And the purpose is to train you in what? Righteousness. Connect those dots. Notice something else. Think about how close the word discipline is with another biblical word, disciple. Discipline and disciple are actually very closely related and actually their meanings are very close to one another. God's discipline serves to make us Christ's disciples. That's what God's aiming for in your life. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to train to follow him. Remember, we looked at that last week. We get rid of all the sin that entangles us. It so easily encumbers us, right? We do that. What else do we do? We train for endurance. We talked about that last week. And then what's the third thing? We keep our eyes fixed on Christ. What's discipleship, church, at its core? It's keeping our eyes fixed on Christ. It's following him. It's doing what he does, how he does and it's learning. The trials we face are divinely designed to mature you so that you will be serviceable in the kingdom of God. Now, isn't that a good thing? Now, I know on the surface, we're like, oh, that's a good thing, Pastor John. I like the sound of that. But we don't like walking through it. We don't like training through it. We just want, as always, we want the easy route. We want the benefits without the work. Right? We want to take the diet pill that requires nothing other than to sit there and lose 100 pounds. 
Christianity doesn't work that way. There's not a diet pill for Christianity. There's not a, a magic bullet. It's training, training, training through discipline for the purpose of righteousness. Are you being corrected and trained this morning by hardship? Is that a reality to you this morning? Remember, brothers, sisters, God is not smiting you with his wrath. That's not what he's doing. Don't think that. He's not smiting you with his wrath. He's correcting you with his love. That's what he's doing. And every one of us who are in Christ have had to learn that way. There's no other way around it. It's the normal way of God doing it. Correcting us with love. Now, are you recognizing that? Are you training and are you becoming a fit disciple? These are good questions. These are questions we're going to expand on more next week. Help you to understand a little better. Are you allowing yourself to be trained by the hardship you endure? I just want that question to kind of sink in this week. Uh, can you even recognize, can you even recognize godly discipline in your life? Or do you take it so lightly? It has no effect. God disciplines out of love. And these trials expose our weaknesses. How we handle a given trial reveals the areas in life that were the weakest, that we need the most work. Our trials strengthen us out of the weakest parts of our faith. The weakest. God is targeting those weakest parts. And if we pass that test, that training that God brings through punishment, well then, God has purified that area and he's, and he's, and he's brought us to the next level as, as Romans says Romans says in our sanctification, sanctification, from glory to glory to glory. He's bringing us upward. Hey, hey, great job responding to that training. You did it. Hey, now let's work on the next thing. I've told this story before. I'm sorry. I might be going long. I don't, I don't really care that much. I want you guys to grab, grasp all this, right? But I remember when I was 19 years old, right? And, and I was in a prayer meeting and there was this little old lady sitting next to me. She, I don't know, she was like 80 probably. And we were praying over the sins in our lives and, 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 and I was struggling with sexual sin and, 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 and temptation for pornography and I'm like, I'm up next and I got to confess this sin and she goes right before me and she's just broken. She's teary-eyed and she's lamenting because she's eating too many potato chips. Seriously. And she said, I go to potato chips when I'm depressed and when I'm down. I don't go to the Lord. She was broken over that. You see, God was training her subtly because God had sanctified her to the point where potato chips were her biggest problem. But it was still a sin in her life. It was still a problem. I was embarrassed to go next. But God delivered me through my sin from glory to glory to glory. But however, church, if God brings discipline and we fail, then he will continue to refine us with another test and another test and another test and another test because he loves us too much. He will not stop disciplining us. Remember our text said, an earthly father disciplines for a short time. What seems best to him? God doesn't do that. He'll discipline our entire life if that's what it takes. If God's voice of discipline is in your ears this morning, perhaps through difficult circumstances, then I just encourage you to take a moment this morning to pause and listen to his voice. Examine your own heart. Examine what God might be trying to teach you through this. Don't always cast your eyes on the person next to you or the other person involved in the struggle. What is God trying to teach you if you're wise and obedient, then you will bid goodbye to the unbelief in your life. You'll bid goodbye and break ties with the sin in your life. You'll leave behind the regret, the wayward habits, the attitudes, the grudges, the bitterness, the questions, the self-pity. You're going to throw it all away and you're going to train. When we do that and we trust the Lord along the way, and as we need to learn one very, very important thing. And it goes back to the way Jesus taught us to pray. Lord, Thy will be done, not my own. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you so much for this time together this morning and for the incredible gift of your word. Lord, I understand that these these ideas as we look at your word, these can be the hard ones to, to, to work through, to, to come to grips with. And especially, Lord, as we look at the, 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 this is such a real sermon. This is such a real thing because we've all faced discipline at your hand, Lord. Sometimes we've responded well and we've trained and we've learned and sometimes, Lord, we have failed. We have failed the test. We have failed the discipline. Lord, strengthen us this morning. Help us to not take lightly the discipline you are bringing and help, help us, Lord, to not lose heart. Ground us in your love this morning, Lord. Sustain us, keep us, walk with us, encourage us, Lord, because ultimately that's what this is. This is not a, a doom and gloom message, Lord. This is, this is encouragement. You love us. You love us. And now, Lord, help us to surrender anew this day to your discipline, to surrender to your training. Give us spiritual eyes, Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit to know what it is you are trying to teach us in both the subtle disciplines and even the severe, Lord. Keep us focused on you. Jesus Christ is the author and the perfecter of our faith. May we fix on him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.